I would like to bring up Haley Matson Mathis. She is the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. It's a nonprofit group that champions culinary education, not only for post-secondary students like, like you, but also high school students, as well as professional cooks and professional chefs. So, Haley, welcome. Thank you, Don. It's a pleasure to be back at Leeward Community College. We were here with you last semester with Chef Joanne Chang, and today we have something outstanding in store for you. The Hawaii Culinary Foundation's mission is the culinary students, all of you at each of the community college campuses throughout the state of Hawaii. And our whole goal is to inspire you as the next generation of working cooks and chefs to uh, in, raise and elevate the cuisine within Hawaii. And today we have one such chef who is, is going to illustrate that with the demonstration we have. We also have a culinary program that works in the high schools and mentoring the high school culinary students to inspire them to come on to the community college campuses and continue their education and we hope be the next generation working in restaurants like uh, Chef Bao's restaurant. Our guest chef today is uh, an exceptional chef that we're very fortunate to have with us, Chef Bao Tran, and he is with DB Restaurant Group and he is the executive chef of Mad Bene. And Chef Bao has an exceptional background because he graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. But he did start out, um, and he'll tell you about his humble roots starting out. He worked as a busser in a restaurant. He started out in, the, in his high school in a vocational culinary program in Virginia. But he went on to work at some top-notch restaurants, some of which you'll recognize um, in New York. Um, one is David Chang's Momofuku Bar and Noodle Bar. And then he also worked for the likes of Andrew Carmanelli. Daniel Hum, and the list goes on. So he really worked at some top locations. But his passion for Italian food um, was inspired by a stage that he did in Italy um, outside of Pisa. And I'm sure he'll ex visit with you about his mentor who inspired him while he was there. And we're very fortunate that he returned to Hawaii to share what he has learned um, through his travels and through his work. He also worked while he was in New York at a two-star, not an easy achievement for, by the New York Times where he was the chef de cuisine at the restaurant Santina, which is quite a major accomplishment. So we're fortunate in Hawaii that he is not only expanding his roots from Mad Bene, but to some other operations that they'll be talking to you about today. And we're going to talk about one of the things that I love the most from time that I spent in Italy with an Italian family who I still keep in touch with today. We're going to be talking about pasta. Thank you very much, Chef Bao, for being with us. We're honored to have you. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to start by saying uh, thank you, first of all, to Haley for uh, reaching out to me and providing me this great opportunity. And thank you, LCC, all the fantastic chefs and teachers and faculty for uh, welcoming me in, helping me out, and helping me set up. Uh, just to the students that are here too, thank you for attending. I know it's not live, but uh, hopefully you can learn a few things via Zoom and then uh, we will have some tastings for you later as well. So be excited for that. Um, also to the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation for uh, supporting us and sponsoring this event and making sure that we make it a good one. Uh, I also have today with me uh, Kanan Roman. He's a graduate of LCC. Uh, he's also a line cook for us at Mad Bene. Uh, today we're going to talk primarily about pasta. Uh, I am an Italian chef, but you can't really go over that in an hour, and a half, hour and a half time span, right? So pasta is something that's very important to me. Um, of course, it's very important to Italian cuisine itself and the way they dine and how that happens. So I'm going to get very technical, but I'm also going to tell a lot of stories about pasta so you can get a better understanding of something that seems so simple but once you really dive deeply into it it, it gets very um, for me fascinating and um, complicated uh, before we do get started with that uh, i brought a machine with me here today this is a pasta extruder um, so there are three primary types of pasta i would say that in italy and in america 
So you have dried extruded pasta, which comes from a machine like this, but on a much larger commercial scale. So what happens is uh, semolina flour and water, sometimes egg, is mixed in this hopper and then forced out. It kind of looks like a meat grinder, I would say, but instead of, it like spins and pushes out just like a meat grinder, but instead of meat, we're doing pasta. You have many different dyes for different shapes too. So that pushes this pasta out, it gets cut, and then it gets dried. So that's what you find in the supermarket when you go to Amazon or buy any sort of artisanal dried pasta. It's 99% of the time semolina flour and water. Uh, so at the restaurant, we do the same process. We don't use any dry pasta, we make it ourselves. So again, I have semolina flour and water. So I'll show you what that looks like. So the ratio uh, is about three parts flour to one part water. That varies depending on the humidity, uh, altitude, uh, quality of flour, hydration of flour, like a ton of different things. But generally it's about one third water to, sorry, one part water to three parts flour. So when you make pasta by hand, uh, when you're kneading it, you're forming gluten, right? It's the protein matrix of pasta, of wheat. Uh, we're going to mix the flour in here, but what actually forms the gluten in this pasta is a process of extrusion. So all that pressure, all that PSI, pushing the dough through this is creating that gluten structure. So when we're mixing this flour and water in here, the dough's going to look very crumbly. It's going to look like streusel dough. It's not going to come together like a typical pasta dough would. I'll start the mixing process and I'll show you what that looks like. So right now we're not really, uh, again, we're not really forming a dough necessarily. We're just hydrating the flour. And the mixing process takes about three to four minutes because we're not really, again, we're not forming gluten. We're not really uh, working the dough itself. We just wanna make sure that the flour is being hydrated by the water. Uh, if any students or faculty have any questions during this process, let me know. We have a, a few minutes here. Yes. Does the water need to be a certain temperature? Uh, we use room temperature. Room temperature. And then at the restaurant, we also have a water softening and filtration system. So it gets uh, softened once and filtered twice. Uh, we also make pizza at the restaurant and we want like not necessarily the cleanest water it's not the right word we want like water that's not hard and full of minerals we want like very neutral soft water so if you were going to do this at home what kind of water would you recommend i uh, recommend uh, bottled water okay. like distilled water or, or spring distilled, water yeah. yeah okay that goes for any uh, dough or baking really where apparently like, water is such a huge ingredient right i mean for what our it, pasta it's, it's only two ingredients we make all the pasta in house so we want to make sure we get the best flour possible. Uh, this one's from Sicily. We import it. And we try to make the best water that we can get as well. What, what do the minerals do? Why don't you want minerals in the water? Uh, it's going to provide an off taste. And oh, if you okay. notice, if you cook that uh, hard water, pasta made with hard water in your pasta water, it's going to turn black over time. Hmm. That's from all the hard minerals and um, Thank you. solids, soft solids. Soft solids. So water is in, we are mixing. It's been about maybe two, two and a half minutes. I'm gonna stop the machine for a second to show you what this kind of looks like. Uh, Chef, um, what is the difference between semolina and um, like a bread flour? So semolina still has some of its endosperm attached or on it, I guess, not as re refined or processed as that flour. It's also a harder wheat. Mm -hmm. So what we get is the pasta doesn't quite absorb as much liquid and doesn't really form a paste or a dough. Uh, so I will show you now what this flour looks like. If you can look in this pan, like 
it's almost it almost looks like it's like not a dough at all, but it's not. But once you squeeze it in your hand, it forms a solid piece. So this is what we're looking for when we're shooting. Because I just applied maybe one or two pounds of pressure and it formed a, uh, almost a solid piece. But this is gonna put many, many more times of PSI uh, against the dough itself. So it's gonna form like a smooth pasta. So we're gonna let this mix and hydrate for another two minutes and then we're gonna start the extrusion process. Uh, again, I think I talked about forms of pasta earlier, there being three. The third one would be uh, your, your typical like hand kneaded with egg dough that you use a roller to flatten or a rolling pin and cut. So that would be the third way. So that's what we normally associate with fresh pasta. This is also fresh pasta, but fresh extruded. So while we finish this up, I'll talk a little bit about like the philosophy of pasta in regards to American pasta and Italian pasta. So I think a good example would be we, uh, like any chain restaurant that serves pasta, like you usually see like a bowl of noodles on a plate and then like some sauce and a bunch of protein and vegetables ladled over. So that's like a very American-ish, American-Italian style way of cooking. But in Italian cuisine, we finish, there's, I don't think there's any exceptions actually, maybe besides lasagna, like we finish each pasta in the sauce that it's served with. That serves uh, quite a few purposes. So pasta itself is porous, so what's gonna happen is the pasta is gonna release some of its starch into the water and thicken it. And while that happens, osmosis happens, so it's gonna absorb some sauce as well into the pasta, so we get deeper flavor, and each bite is like full of sauce and coated instead of being just two separate things, right? So that, that is a, a big key. Whenever you make pasta at home, or anywhere really professionally, you should always be tossing your um, pasta in its sauce. We'll, we'll get a better idea of what it looks like when we, when we uh, do the cooking portion of this. Okay, so it's been about four minutes, maybe five. Uh, Dough looks good, nice and crumbly. Uh, Kanan is going to step in and uh, start cutting while I talk more about uh, pasta itself. So we're going to do two shapes today. We're doing a spaghetti and a muffledine. So about halfway through, we're going to switch the dies out and we'll see the differences there. So while Kanan is uh, working this pasta here, it's come out in a second. So if you guys had Play-Doh as children, it's probably very similar. You get those same kind of vibes right now, right? So we actually have uh, two machines at the restaurant. We have uh, this smaller one and we have a floor model that's about as big as a, like a 40 quart Hobart mixer. So like this machine can produce about maybe 14 pounds an hour, and the other one produces about 40. So we got two machines because uh, we're looking to um, extrude pasta fresh for all of our restaurants in the future. So another thing about pasta, especially when you're looking at commercially produced pasta and artisanally or fresh extruded pasta, you're gonna notice, I'm not sure if you can pick it up on camera here, but uh, in, in this hand here, I have a commercially produced pasta. It's very smooth and not much texture going on. Uh, this next one that's quite a little bit paler is an artisanally produced uh, spaghetti out of pizza. And it's rough. It's like kind of the texture of um, like sandpaper almost. And then here's a piece of our extruded pasta. It also has the same sort of texture. Uh, let's see, you guys want to feel it. I'll pass it to the faculty. Uh, the difference from that comes from the method of production. So the smoothest pasta, the commercially produced one, uses stainless steel dyes. So the dye is the piece that 
is right here. That determines the shape. Stainless steel is a very hard and smooth metal. So what you end up with is a very smooth pasta. Uh, traditionally, when they first started extruding pasta, bronze dyes were used. So bronze is a softer metal. It's a little bit of, a, not porous, but it's a lot of imperfections in the bronze itself. And what you get from that is that, that rough texture. And then we use bronze dyes as well, so we also achieve that rough texture. Um, that is a primary reason why our pasta and artisanally produced dry pastas will get thicker, absorb more sauce, and have generally more flavor. Because the softer or the smoother pastas, the commercially produced ones, will not absorb sauce as well. Um, if you were to ask me, I'm not sure if someone, someone might have done like a scientific study behind it, but I would say it's like 50% as delicious because it absorbs maybe 50% less sauce. Um, so that is why materials, technique matters, but materials and the equipment you use also matters. So, so we, Canaan's uh, cutting the spaghetti here. So we go about 10 inches at the restaurant. Um, most of the ones you buy commercially are about eight. I like a longer noodle because I like Asian noodles and they're generally longer. So we kind of meet halfway with that. Now we are switching the dye. So at the restaurant we have about 12 different shapes that we do. Uh, any questions? What, what shapes do you do at the restaurant? Sorry? What 12 shapes do you do? Uh, we have muffledine, which he's going to do next. That's like a ribbon. Uh, we have rigatoni, spaghetti, spaghettini, linguine, tagliatelle, pappardelle, campanelle, fusilli, lasagna sheeter, ravioli sheeter. One more. I'll, it'll come back to me, but we have a bunch. <laughs> And, uh, eat. Hmm. How, uh, why, why would you put eggs versus no eggs? Uh, so it depends on the recipe. So for egg pastas, uh, generally you would find those in like long flat shapes. So that would be your tagliatelle, pappardelle, fettuccines. Uh, spaghetti, traditionally never with egg. Uh, also linguine, because it, it kind of depends on what sauce they go with. Yeah. So you think of tagliatelle and pappardelle going with like meaty, braises, ragus. So the extra fat really complements and makes the noodles softer and richer. Whereas spaghettis and linguines and uh, penne's and stuff will go with like a tomato sauce or a pesto sauce. Um, so like they, you want a little more of a neutral flavor to let the flavors of those sauces come through a little bit more. When, when you're mixing the sauce with the pasta, mm. how long does it need to um Absorb Each one's different. Uh, I think Kanan can attest to it. He's, he's probably made at least 20,000 plates of pasta in his career at Mad Bene here. Uh, each one is different. Uh, it all really depends on how far you took the sauce in the pan in the first place, uh, how old the pasta is. If you just extruded it, it's a lot less. If it's been sitting around for a day or two, maybe sometimes twice as long. Uh, that's, that's why I think pasta is one of the hardest things as a professional cook to get right. Because if you think about it, if you're making it properly, you're making each sauce and each dish to order. Because at the restaurant, we don't really, we never ladle sauce or never pre-make a bunch of sauce. Like each time you get a pasta at a proper Italian restaurant, it's gonna be made to order. Um, a la minute. So we'll show you what that looks like after we extrude here. Uh, while we are going, while we're finishing that, uh, the next step to making really good pasta would be to get your water correct. Uh, I think there's a lot of like, in my entire career, I never really had a recipe for salt water, so I never really thought about it. I just seasoned it till it was correct. But uh, I think the, fir the first time I decided to like get a proper recipe for my own use was when someone told me that pasta water should be as salty as the ocean. And like growing up around the ocean and then moving here and like there's, there's no way that that's correct because like the ocean is so much saltier than what correct pasta water would be. So I actually like looked it up, did my, did my research. 
So in the Pacific Ocean, the salinity of the water on average at surface level is about 3.5% salinity. Um, proper pasta water is at 2%. So we're asking, that's almost double of what some people would say is the correct amount. So, um, we're going to season some pasta water right now, actually. So back here, um, we have three, li sorry, six liters of water. So six liters is 6,000 grams. 2% uh, of that is, what is that? 120. So at the restaurant, we have two 40 gallon tanks and then uh, it equals out to half a box of kosher salt. It works out perfectly. But when you're doing it at home, or when I do it at home, I always measure it out. If you're looking for like a kind of an indicator of what 2% is like, I would say it's like you're making soup and then you accidentally over seasoned it a little bit. That's what it should taste like. Like well seasoned to the point of like, oh, this is probably a little bit too salty to serve. Oh, that's a lot of salt. Mm. <laughs> What is your favorite type of pasta? My favorite type of pasta is spaghetti. I always love spaghetti. And it's, it's like simple, it's, well, like it's very versatile. Um, like the mouth feel is great. It's like, like these like perfectly like rods. Like it's like a good slurping pasta. It takes on sauce very well. Um, so I first started cooking pasta at an Italian restaurant called La Conda Verde in New York. So before then, I only had one other restaurant job out of culinary school. That was at Momofuku Noodle Bar. So again, like noodles and noodles, right? But like two very different approaches. The first restaurant was primarily um, ramen. So like you don't really manipulate the noodle that much. Like you, of course, you got to make sure the water is boiling. Uh, it's not seasoned, actually. But like you're cooking it with a timer. It, it's al dente and then you put it into a bowl of like boiling hot broth. But when I got to La Conda, I couldn't figure out like the process of getting pasta right every time. There's something so foreign to me because, so the expert I recall like a, let's say a string of 15 pastas. So you have 15 different shapes, 15 different sauces, 15 different cooking times, and they all have to go up the window at the same time. So like that, like figuring that out was like, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a professional, but at the same time, like once you nail it, like you can cook pasta anywhere. Like if you do it, you learn how to do it properly once somewhere, then like that's a skill that will carry with you and will impress any Italian chef that you ever run across. So I would recommend that like any students looking to get into the savory side of things in the savory kitchen, uh, definitely try to find a restaurant that has a really robust pasta program and spend at least a year or two there and then just like really nail that skill. And like, it's invaluable. There's a, there's a ton of really bad pasta out there, you know? But if you really learn that master that skill, it's, it's, it's really impressive, I would say. All right. Uh, Kane's gonna finish that up. Uh, I'm gonna start my demo of our two pastas today. We're gonna make a spaghetti pomodoro, uh, also known as a spaghetti with tomato sauce. And then we're also gonna make the muffledine alfredo. So this is our muffledine. It's a ribbon, long ribbons. Uh, before we start, any, any uh, faculty or student questions? Yeah. Um, why did you, how, how or why did you become a chef? Uh, so I think Haley introduced it earlier. I haven't talked about it yet, but I started my I would say my culinary career in high school. So in my junior year, um, there was a vocational culinary class and I decided to take it because everyone that took it before say it's an easy A, like you don't have to think. It's just like you come to, you come to this class, you're like, you learn how to cook, you can slack off and then you go home, get your easy A. Uh, it wasn't like that at all. So <laughs> when I got there, the chef was a, a real hard ass, I would say. Um, he, because he was so passionate, 
he had, he had the same kind of energy that like all the instructors here kind of remind me of him in the way that like it wasn't just a cl high school class right it, it was his career it was his passion and he wanted to transfer those skill sets and that passion into other students and like watching him like I, I had he was the the most passionate teacher out of any of my high school teachers that I had through my entire life so like that really resonated with me it's like wow like like someone can really care this much about cooking. I, I didn't know that was a thing, you know? So like, the more I did it, the, the more I realized, like this is the first subject in high school that like, not that I was good at, but the first one that I, I was really engaged with and like I wanted to do for a living. So after junior and senior year, two years of that class, I went to culinary school at the CIA. Uh, 17 then, two year program, and then when I graduated, I knew that like, well, I was 19, right? So like, what do you, what do you really know when you're 19? Like, I think all you know is like, you want to do something that will make an impact or in your life, not necessarily on other people, but for you. So like, I decided to pick like the hardest city that I could find and the hardest job I could find. And coincidentally, that's also the lowest paying job that I could find. <laughs> And then uh, I moved to New York, one suitcase, uh, no apartment. I uh, actually found my roommate the first day I worked. I was lucky enough to, to get a roommate. Uh, and then I was, spent 10 years there before moving to Hawaii four years ago. Uh, a lot of different restaurants. Um, it's like I spent at least a year and a half, almost two years at each restaurant just to learn. Uh, I was a line cook for six years, sous chef for two. Uh, Chef of Cuisine and Executive Chef for my final two years in New York. Is that a good answer? Yeah, great answer. Uh, if there's no more questions for now, I'll start my cooking demo. Cool. All right, uh, the fun part. So Kane is going to keep rolling on that. How much uh, flour is left in there? Quite a bit. We'll keep going on that. I think I'll do more spaghetti. Sure. So my water's at a simmer right now. Again, I want to make sure it's at a full rolling boil. I'm going to taste my pasta water. Perfect. So the first time I also cooked pasta too, like the first night I worked the pasta station, I cooked like 10 pastas, put them up. Chef told me to cook 10 more pastas and then I put 10 more up, and they told me, the chef said, like, wow, these are terrible. What did you do differently? I said, oh, I have no idea, chef. Like, same sauce, they look the same. It's like, they're so bland. Like, did you add salt? Like, what, what happened? What did you do? I'm like, oh, I have no idea. Then he came around, and he, he tasted my pasta water. I'm like, oh, like, that's crazy. Like, who would, who would taste that? Like, we, see, we already seasoned it, right? But then, like, he explained to me, like, so the pasta is absorbing the salt from the water. So... From that point on, I made it a point, like every time I cooked even just one pasta, I would taste the water again to make sure it's okay. Whether it be 100 pastas, one pasta, two pasta pickup, I always taste it, always re-season. I would re-season my water maybe, I would say 40 to 50 times in like one dinner service. So over five hours, like, what is that? Every six minutes, I would check the water and re-season. Whether it be like a, just a tiny pinch of salt or a big fistful, uh, that's probably, uh, I think Kanan can attest to it because I ask him about 50 times a night when we're working service that that is the number one thing you can do besides making sure your water is at a rapid boil to make sure your pasta is always delicious. Because no matter how much you season your pasta sauce, if your pasta itself, pasta water is under seasoned, it's never going to taste good. What you're going to end up with is like over seasoned sauce and like bland noodles and those two, like you can taste the difference in it. First one we're doing is the, oh, a new gas. Oh, never mind. Very good. Spaghetti Pomodoro. So a classic tomato sauce, but we're doing it a little bit of a different way. Uh, I learned this pasta when I was working in Italy uh, in 2014. A restaurant was called Ristorante La Dogana. It was on top of a hill overlooking a sheep farm and then into the ocean. 
So like your classic, um, stereotypical Italian villa kind of vibe. And there, I worked there during the summer. And in the summer, they would make a fresh tomato sauce. What does that mean? I'll show you today. Uh, we we're fortunate here in Hawaii because uh, in the North Shore, we have Ho Farms. They are the only producer of soil-grown tomatoes on Oahu, and they are fantastic tomatoes. They're right here, cherry tomatoes. So we start off with a little bit of olive oil. Sliced garlic. So this is garlic that we take on the mandolin, super thin, and we're going to toast it. So the Italian um, philosophy of pasta is about building layers of flavor. That's why like, we talked earlier about never just ladling sauce or pre-making sauce. It's because there's a lot of volatile aromas and flavors in garlic, in aromatics, in olive oil, in butter that over time will fade. So each time we have a pasta at the restaurant, we're doing this process. Olive oil and garlic. I think uh, the students, you guys have um, these recipes in front of you. I think it's all grammed out. So the restaurant, we don't sit there and like weigh each ingredient. I just did it for your benefit. So if you ever want to make it at home, then you can use those exact gram amounts. But at the restaurant, we do use uh, metric measurements and we do weigh all ingredients. I'm not sure uh, how, how much of that we're doing here, but that's pretty standard in a lot of uh, New York and LA restaurants. If you guys ever decide to go work in the mainland, prepare to weigh a lot of things in grams. So I'm uh, constantly moving my pan. I want to make sure my garlic toasts evenly. Uh, any pan and any burner, no, no matter how good they are, will develop hot spots. So when you're cooking pasta, especially the sauce, you're always moving it around. So I take it to about here. You can start to see like all the little pieces are nice and toasty brown. And the larger pieces themselves are starting to toast and brown on the edges. Next we go in with our chili. So we're gonna toast this up in the pan. This is a Calabrian chili in oil. So it's a fermented Italian chili preserved in olive oil. Very fragrant, very spicy. So again, building layers of flavor, we want to make sure we toast our chili, not just throw it in there. Next up, uh, beautiful Whole Farms tomatoes. And then, some of our pasta water. And then a little bit of fresh water as well, un unsalted fresh water. So again, talking about fresh tomato sauce, this is where the fresh tomato like aspect comes from. So inside the tomato itself, there's a lot of uh, pectin, the seeds, the flesh. So what I'm doing is using the back of a spoon over low heat to extract the flavor from the tomato. So I'm squeezing as much juice and liquid out of the tomato as I can. At the restaurant, this is uh, the cook's least favorite pasta to pick up because um, you have to squeeze each and every tomato until it's, it almost, it's almost indistinguishable. Again, tons of tom uh, pectin in tomato. So pectin is found in a lot of fruits as well. It's a natural thickener. What you're going to notice is um, this sauce and this liquid is getting thicker as I squeeze out the pulp from the tomato. Can you want to drop a pasta portion in? Let's do sp uh, spaghetti, 120 grams. Chef, can you use any kind of tomato or? Are no, you so using 
Cherry tomatoes are the only real tomato you can use. Uh, I'll try it with grape tomatoes, but they're, they're too... There's not enough juice in them. The skin's really thick. It doesn't really produce a great result. So the best thing you can find is a thin-skinned uh, cherry tomato. Okay. So you can see like how much color that tomato provided. It's like a golden hue, a golden red. It's thickened. At this point, I'll turn my heat off while the pasta cooks. So I don't want to over-reduce it. And then I will add my Sicilian tomato paste. It's called Stratu. Uh, it roughly translates to extract. Uh, this tomato paste is really cool because unlike most commercially produced tomato paste, this is literally just tomatoes and olive oil. So in the summer, they'll pick ripe tomatoes, uh, peel them, seed them, lay them out on these like huge wooden tables. They're like probably like 60 feet long. And they just dry in the sun over the course of a day. I'm sorry, two days. And then they take that uh, dried pulp. It kind of resembles uh, sun-dried tomatoes at that point. And they just puree it uh, with olive oil and, that, and a little bit of salt for preserving it. So what you end up with is like a very dense, umami rich, like pure tomato flavor. So like a, a little bit of that in the end, I'm gonna swirl it in just to reinforce that tomato flavor. And then you can kind of see how luscious and thick it got. Um, it's, uh, I think, what the French would call a uh, nappe, right? Kind of coats the spoon. How long we got, Kenny? How long has it been? I didn't drop it. Oh, let's drop it. So this is just extruded. So it shouldn't take longer than what, Kenny? A minute and a half, probably? About a minute and a half. mean? Good question. <laughs> so it's kind of like two Italian slang and New York slang. So bene would be like a general sense of like well-being, like, oh, like tutto bene, everything's good, right? And then mad is New York slang for a lot of something. So if something's like mad delicious, it's like very delicious. If something is um, mad, it's mad hot outside today, when it's like, maybe like today, actually. So like mad bene means like very good, like a mishmash cool. of Italian and American. <laughs> okay, so pasta is almost ready. I'll turn my heat back on to make sure my sauce is hot, not boiling, but hot. Why don't you want it to boil? Uh, I don't want to over reduce it. Uh, the question is why I don't want it to boil. Um, I don't want. I want the pasta to spend time with the sauce. If I over reduce it now, it's not going to have enough time. Okay. I'm going to drag a little bit of the starchy water into my pan. About like a what's that? A teaspoon maybe. Now we finish. So the first thing I always do is lay the pasta evenly across the sauce. Uh, the pasta is not done after a minute and a half. It's a little bit underdone. It finishes cooking in the sauce itself. So now we're at a boil. I always let it spend about at least 30 seconds totally flat. So I'm making sure that all of my noodles are cooking evenly. After that, I start tossing. So tossing is also very critical in the pasta making process. When you're agitating it like that, you're releasing more starch from the semolina flour that's in the pasta. And you're also emulsifying the fat with the liquid part. Mm 
I'm gonna add a splash of wa uh, fresh water just to get a little bit more sauce going here. So I would say like a, a good rule of thumb would be like I toss my pasta at least 30 times in the pan before we plate it. And you see like it was kind of loose, like two separate entities about a minute ago. Now if you look at it, it's one. You, a good, another, another good rule of when your sauce is ready, if you uh, drag your spoon or, or tongue across the, the bottom of the plate, you'll notice the sauce doesn't come back on the bottom of the pan. That's when you know you have the perfect amount of sauce. If you have too much sauce, like it's gonna be like a pool on the bottom. And if it comes back together right away, it's too thin, it won't coat the noodle. Thank you. To finish, we turn the heat off. So when you finish pasta, you're adding the most temperature sensitive ingredients at the end. Ingredients that will lose flavor or change flavor if they get too hot. Uh, those being butter. So if you add butter too soon, it's going to break, right? Because it's almost, all the water is gone, only the butter fat's left. You're going to have broken butter. You get greasy pasta. Uh, basil. It's a fresh herb, right? So if, if you had basil that's cooked too long, it turns black and brown. It's not fragrant anymore. Uh, Parmesan cheese. Parmigiano Reggiano we created at the restaurant. If you add cheese too soon, cheese also breaks. You end up with a greasy sauce. And then finally, finishing olive oil. So the olive oil I used earlier is a, a large can extra virgin olive oil. It's meant for cooking. This is meant for salad dressings and finishing. So a lot more flavor, unfiltered, cloudy, spicy, and bitter. Olive oil loses its temperature right at around 140 degrees. So what you end up with, you lose like those spicy components, the fruity notes. So you always add it at the end, off the heat. Looking a little thick, so I'm gonna add another splash of water. And our final few tosses. A little bit of hot water. So pasta is a, a dish all about adjustments. So little tiny adjustments throughout the entire process gets you the desired result. So it's good. Can you want to plate? Can's gonna plate that up. As you notice, like he's not gonna have a lot of trouble picking up the entire bundle almost because like it's all one homogenous unit. I was talking about Italian and American pasta earlier. Like a, a, the Italian philosophy of how pasta should eat and taste is like each bite that you have should taste the same. That's why there's like no chunks of anything, no chicken, no like peppers or anything like that. Because you want each bite to taste the same. A little olive oil on top, that's it. Fresh spaghetti Beautiful. pomodoro. And we have uh, one more dish today. Oh, Kenny, you want to do, do it? The Alfredo? Yeah. Kenny will prepare it and I'll, uh, I'll take some questions and talk a little bit more about pasta. Uh, the next one we're doing is a muffledine Alfredo. This is probably the most difficult pasta sauce in the world, in my opinion, to make correctly. Uh, Alfredo is oftentimes looked at as very like pedestrian or like low class dish. Uh, technically like the American, like what we know as Alfredo isn't even really Italian. Uh, the Italian Alfredo is just butter and cheese, but Americans add butter, cheese, parsley, cream, and garlic. So four of those five ingredients um, get really thick in sauce. Like when you reduce cream, it gets really thick and goopy. Cheese gets thick, uh, butter thickens, Cream, butter, cheese. Uh, oh, it's olive oil too. So like, you have so many different types of fat going on. And when fat and water form an emulsion like salad dressing, right, it gets thick. When you have like a sauce that's like 90% fat, and controlling the 
consistency of your final sauce is super important. I'll talk about that as we go. Should I bring some uh, heavy cream, please? Cream. Any questions? <laughs> Perfect. So, um, is there somebody in your career that really inspired you a lot? In my career, I would say the person who inspired me the most was David Chang because he made it a point to tell me how bad of a job I was doing every day. Uh, as my first job, like as a 19 year old in New York City, I really needed that push to like get me to the next level because like nothing was ever good enough so like I, I i needed to look inside myself to really figure out what it was that i wasn't really focusing on it was so many things right at that time it wasn't necessarily my aptitude i would say it was more of my attitude at that point like i was after graduating from culinary school and especially the cia like i think a lot of graduates there have an ego problem or ego issues um, i don't think anyone should graduate culinary school no matter how good you are or how your grades were expecting to be a chef. Um, that is the, the one lesson I think uh, and one takeaway I would give you guys, like spend as much time cooking as you can, uh, whether you're in a bakery, in a professional kitchen, at a hotel, in a cruise ship, like find somewhere that really challenges you, that makes you, especially if you're like really young, find somewhere that challenges you every day and makes you wanna almost quit every week. And then if you can spend, three good years um, learning that and then spend another three good years at another restaurant, you're gonna have so much more of a leg up than any CIA graduate that's ever existed. Um, the program here is fantastic. Uh, you have really incredibly passionate instructors and faculty here, more so than the CIA, I would say, after spending two years there and like at a much more reasonable price. And like <laughs> facilities wise as well, like it's, it's, it's pretty top notch. So I, I would say, all the students here are incredibly fortunate to have such a passionate, um, such a passionate faculty and such a great environment to work in. I'm excited to see where you guys end up. Um, how did, what, how did you end up in Hawaii? I met my wife in the last restaurant that I worked in, and she was born and raised here. And I had achieved the goals I set out to achieve while I was in New York. So when when I moved there, I said I want to be a chef within ten years. And then I made it happen. And then the next step for me was like, I want to be able to teach these skills to people, being my staff, and then build the next generation of chefs. Because, um, sorry, to get back on that real quick. Uh, so Kanan's toasting garlic again, a lot of garlic. And now he's adding his cream, slightly reduced. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I just want to make sure that the culinary tradition whether it be here or the mainland or in New York is continued. So meaning like I want to train chefs that are better than me one day and can take these skills, these skills and the knowledge that I gave them and make a better restaurant than what I can make. Like that's the dream. I think of any great chef because like, obviously I don't think anyone thinks anymore that you get into cooking for the money. It's not really there. You need to be really passionate about it and you need to be able to leave a legacy behind. I think that's, that's incredibly important. All right, so you can see now already that uh, Canaan sauces are incredibly thick. That's just from the cream and the olive oil. And the garlic as well thickens the cream a little bit. So once that pasta comes out of the pot, we have about a minute to make it correct. So in that minute, you're gonna see him do probably like 30 different actions to try to adjust the sauce to get to the perfect consistency. Lowering the heat, raising the heat, taking it off the heat, adding water, adding cheese, reducing, adding more water. Like, it's, it's a game of like many, many, many small adjustments to get the perfect result. I th also think like speaking of uh, like Hawaii and the mainland, like when I first moved here four years ago, like I think the caliber of restaurant was not like nowhere near where it is like today. Like so many people, especially up and coming chefs that are opening new restaurants, providing so much more opportunity and like new ways of looking at things. 
So like that, that's awesome too. I think um, all the students here graduating uh, this year or next year are going to have a, a lot of options and where to go and like what kind of jobs that you'll be able to find. Uh, so I staged in Italy in 2014. I had worked at a restaurant called Carbone in New York City. I uh, got a Michelin star. And the chef wanted me to take the next step. So that was my last line cooking job. Uh, getting ready. That was my last line cooking job before I became a sous chef. But before I took that, that, that plunge, I wanted to make sure that I got a chance to travel. Because after you become like a serious manager or a chef or a sous chef for a particular company, like you're pretty much dedicated to that restaurant for at least a few years. So I wanted to make sure that I got as much Italian experience as I could in the place where it's from in order to really solidify my skill set. It's just fun to travel too. Like I saved up about six thousand dollars over the course of three years for this trip. Uh, unpaid stage, of course. And then came back with like $4,000 in credit card debt. So <laughs> if you can make it happen, it's, it's, it's life changing, I, I, I would say. Is it hard to get, let, to get people to let you into their restaurants? No, so actually I was very fortunate. My chef um, knew the owner of the restaurant and uh, put in a word for me to go over there. But yeah, that, that was probably like the number one most influential moment of my career, those four months. Just like being engulfed in like a culture that like food is like the most important thing in the world and like simple food too like like this pasta like five ingredients but just treated really really well that really uh, changed my outlook on cooking before then like I was a chef but, like I wanted to put like 20 ingredients on a plate a twill a flour uh, six different types of oils and then when I came back from Italy all I want to cook was like pasta with five ingredients like. So again, like, uh, if anyone has the means and the time and the commitment, I would recommend leaving the country to cook for a while. Do it for free, because you learn the most when you cook for free. Thanks. Um, how did the pandemic affect Mad Bene? So Mad Bene, I think any restaurant in Hawaii can really attest to the first shutdown being like the hardest moment of their lives. But for me, it was definitely the hardest for me personally and professionally in my career. Uh, I, had, I had to lay off my entire staff uh, twice. So there were two shutdowns. Uh, fortunately, guys like Kanan came back twice, thank you, and are killing it now. Uh, there were days where it would be me and a sous chef and my wife doing like takeout orders all day by ourselves, opening, prepping, cleaning, cooking, there from like seven in the morning till three in the morning sometimes. Um, but that also like kind of solidified in my mind that what I'm doing is for my staff and for the future. So like if we weren't able to come together and like keep the restaurant alive with takeout for those few months, like we wouldn't be able to hire back our staff. Mm -hmm. so, and we were, I'm just happy to have everyone back. So after the first and second shutdowns, we were to hire back 90% of our staff. Everyone who wanted to come back had a job That's back. great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then that's it, yeah. I mean, hopefully we're at the end of the pandemic, but we're still, um, still chugging along. Do you think um, getting a culinary education is important? I do. I think getting a culinary education sets you up uh, with discipline. It sets you up with like the lingo of the kitchen. Like you know what a bain marie is or a sauteuse is. Like not a lot of kitchens will tell you that right away. Like they'll just they'll throw you in the line. Like hey, give me a sauteuse. You have no idea what that is, right? It's like. As a foundation, I think it's critical that you have some sort of training, whether it be like, so I say either go to school or volunteer to work in a really nice kitchen for free without getting paid for as long as you can for a year. But education as a whole and like work experience, hands on, starting from the bottom and working your way up, I think is, is, is absolutely critical. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chef. Uh, do you have any other student questions? I think that's it. OK. All right. So this will kind of conclude our cooking demo here. Uh, two different pastas, uh, all of them seven or less ingredients, I believe, made in under two minutes. Uh, restaurant quality, 
I would say, because again, it's not about how many ingredients are in the pan. Or, uh, it's about sourcing the best you can get and treating each one correctly. I know it's like, I could talk about pasta probably for an entire semester, but we only had an hour today. But hopefully you guys could take away something, learn a couple things, and then good luck and congratulations to your future. Thank you, everyone. Smells delicious. I'm sorry you guys out there on Zoom can't smell it. <laughs> Thank you, Chef. I think you've inspired all of us with your wisdom about how you pursued your education and the importance of your culinary degree and the skills that you've taught today. So we look forward to what's to come for you with your restaurant group, and I hope you'll be able to come back and share with us again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you.